All right, if you guys don't know me, I'm Kumu. Um, I'm here every um, now and then. I'm often out at Ali'i Drive. I'm a worship leader most of the time and stuff like that. But apparently the last time I came out here to preach, um, you guys said it was okay. So we got the okay. We're going to keep rolling this until you guys say, get this guy out of here. All right, so um, well, we're going to start a new sermon series. You can leave that up, Ali. You know, um, we're going to be talking about families. Okay, and why are we going to talk about families? Because we believe that this sermon series is really going to bless your families. Really going to bless your families. You know, you know, when we talk about families these days, you know, we don't always say, oh yeah, that's a blessed family there. What do we normally say? We normally say, man, like, yeah, their, their marriage is maybe not as good as what it could be. Man, raising the kids is harder than they expected it to be. Financially, man, they're really struggling going from paycheck to paycheck. And that has become some of the ways that we have defined families these days. You know, Barbara Bush said in a really interesting thing, I thought it was so fascinating. She says, what is most important about our, cult, our country is not what happens in the White House, but what happens at your house. Right? I mean, there's a lot of talk about our president and all that kind of stuff, but what's really interesting, what makes up the fabric of our communities, the fabric of our nation, right? Fabric of society is our families, right? And so it's not about the politics and what's made at all these high levels. It's really if we can impact, if we can bless your family uh, by t- bringing some biblical teaching in it, we believe that we'll see change. Amen? right? And so families today, are, are, they look differently. Admittedly, they have different struggles. We've seen a lot more blended families these days with, um, uh, you know, you're raising her kids, you know, you, you know, you're raising your kids, you're raising our kids, you know, and it just becomes this really interesting dynamic that has changed over the course of time. We begin to see families change. Uh, There's exes involved, and it becomes difficult. We see a record number of single parents, single moms out there doing the heroic thing, trying to provide for their family on one income. And man, these single parents, man, it's like they need some infusion of just hope in them. And that's what we hope to do in this, this series, is to bring a sense of destiny, a sense of hope, a sense of design, that the way that God intended for families to be. So what we're going to try to do, um, oh, and speaking of, I know that there's a lot of um, YWAMers or students or young people in the crowd and stuff like that, those who may not uh, have an established family yet, and I would say that, man, like, when I was younger, this would have been such a helpful thing to know. It's like, before I get into a marriage, before I get into a relationship, before I start raising kids, what is God's design? What is God's heart so that I can become the husband, the father that he's calling me to be, the mother? Okay, so as a church, we don't want to be passive about families. We want to speak into them. Okay, so that's the next three weeks that we're going to be jumping into this. Today, I'm going to be talking about family values or family culture. I love that word, culture. You know, the values are um, things like um, we value prayer, okay? But the culture piece of that is the practice of the value, okay? So it's like we value prayer in our house, so the culture piece would be like we pray faithfully, we pray daily, okay? And so I may interchange some of these words a little bit, but just so you guys know how I'm viewing these things is values are things that we can say we value, and they may be one word things. We value prayer, we value worship, but what is the culture of your family and the, or the practice of these values that we want to bring into our families? Does that make sense? Yes? Interact with me, yes? yes. Okay, great. Um, Next week, we're going to talk about um, marriage. And so, again, if you're not married, again, this is a great one to come to. This is, will be 
uh, Pastor Ryan's going to be preaching on this, and how marriage is really the core of a healthy family, okay? And the week after that, we're going to be talking about parenting. And I know that Pastor Ryan will share with you guys all the wonderful mistakes that he probably has made and the wonderful successes that he's made in becoming a parent. I'm sure that if you don't have kids, this is something that, again, you're going to want to listen to to learn the wisdom and glean from the wisdom that not only Ryan has, but what is found in Scripture. My dad, he's a funny guy. He, he says, you know, like how he prepared for me to be a dad. He's like, you know, son, I pride myself in the fact that I was a good, bad example for you to follow. <laughs> I was like, thanks, dad. You know, like he was just like, just do everything that I didn't do. Do the opposite. You know, that's what my goal was for you. It made it super easy, you know, you know what I mean? You don't have to live up to my standard. You can just be exactly opposite of me, and that would be awesome. Of course, my dad did an amazing job. I mean, <clears throat> here I am standing. I'm a testament <laughs> to him. Not because I'm awesome, but man, like I had great parents who loved me, and so I'm really blessed by that. Um, but we're going to try to be as transparent as we can with families and stuff like that. I mean, it's no point in me jabbing up here if I'm not being real with you guys. Okay? I'm going to be as transparent as I can. Uh, in our home, uh, there's a lot of people there all the time. And it's really interesting. We have a, a girl that's living with us now that she's renting a room out of us and our house is dynamic in the sense that it's a condo and so she's actually intermixed with our family so you can imagine when um, she's home and stuff like that and my um, kids are misbehaving or something like that I just want to bring the hammer you know what I mean and I'm like whoa, whoa somebody's here you know what I mean like uh, can't really bring that you know what I mean it's just like man we are trying to be on our best behavior when people are there and so, funny story, <clears throat> Father's Day, a few years ago, okay, I had a bunch of people at the house, and they were just hanging out and stuff like that, and I wanted a new TV. Why? Because our TV was too small, you know what I mean? First world problems and stuff like that, and I felt, you know, what a great time. My kids want to bless me. It's Father's Day, you know what I mean, you know? Like, they had no idea that they wanted to buy me a TV, but I made sure that they knew that they were going to buy me a TV. And so what did I do? Of course, the wisdom in the Lord told me to go to the store and buy a TV. You know what I mean? That was so God. You know? And so um, I went to Costco. I picked up the TV. And I knew that our house was full with people. And then so I walked in. And, and just so you guys know, my wife is not a big fan of TVs. Okay, so I walked in, and I had this awesome, epic TV, right? You know, and she's, I was like, hey, guys. Happy Father's Day to me. Thank you, guys. Kids, come over here and give me a hug. I thank you guys so much. And my wife, amongst all of her girlfriends, she has that look in her eye that only I know that is going on, but nobody else knows what's going on. And she's like, that's great, honey. <clears throat> we'll talk about that later. She couldn't actually tell me what she wanted because in the midst of everybody, um, she had to be on her best behavior. But, I mean, that's kind of like, don't do that. Okay, that's, okay, that's, I'm going to strike that from the record. Don't do that. I'm not telling you to manipulate the system, okay? But that's how um, transparent we're going to be this morning is, you know, try to share with you guys um, a little bit of our family, a little bit of my life. Um, but why don't we jump into the, uh, the scripture this morning? And what I wanted to start off with is basically God's original design, God's intent for family. If we start there, then I think we can build a foundation of understanding what God wants to do in our families. Okay, so in Genesis chapter 1, if you have your Bible, you can open up to Genesis chapter 1, 27, 28. It says, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth, and subdue it. So the original design 
when God spoke. And why I love this passage, guys, is because what happens in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 is all of what God really wanted to happen. Genesis chapter 3, what happens? Fall. Sin enters the world. It was not supposed to be The world wasn't supposed to be designed or meant to be thought of as post-Genesis 3. It's supposed to be Genesis 1 and 2. And so when we say, oh yeah, what is a family supposed to look like? Before sin entered the world, it's supposed to be be fruitful, have kids, multiply, have a lot of them fill the earth, he says, right? Right? And he says to control it or subdue the earth, right? So that's the original design that God really wants from our family, right? He wants us to live in his presence because when Adam and Eve was in the garden, who also was there? It was the Lord. And so he wants us to be interacting with his presence, be fruitful, make the cakey, as I like to say it, Okay, maybe we understand that lingo around here more better. Okay, and then subdue the earth. I'm going to speak you guys' language around here, you know what I mean? <clears throat> so what does that mean to be fruitful? The Bible uses metaphors to really kind of give us pictures of a more important um, concepts or ideas. And this is a metaphor, be fruitful, right? Because we're not actually bearing fruit. So what is he saying? We're comparing a tree that bears fruit, produces the results of a healthy tree, produce healthy fruit. The idea here is what God is saying to Adam and Eve is be fruitful, that your life would bear healthy fruit. That fruit is described in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It's called the fruit of the Spirit. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We probably maybe have heard it a different way. Maybe you've sung it, Sunday school. I asked my wife, hey, how did that song go? You know what I mean? And so it's like, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, the fruit of the Spirit of God. We find it in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. And if you're walking close to him, his fruit will grow in you. And they are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, the fruit of the Spirit of God. Hey, good job. Give yourself a hand. Awesome. Why, he's so proud. What is God really doing when he says to be fruitful? What is the purpose? Why would he, you know, I mean, that's the first thing that he said. He created them, and then he gave them their destiny right there. He said, be fruitful. It's like, what are you saying? What does that mean, God? You know, what he's doing is that he is establishing the values that they should have in their relationship with each other. The values of a healthy marriage, right, are modeled in Galatians chapter 5. But what else? The values of a family. We're talking about kids, so have kids. So again, be fruitful and multiply. So take your fruit and multiply that in your family. Teach your kids how to be fruitful. And then be fruitful in your work. Subdue the earth, right? We're not going to separate these things. We're going to be fruitful in our marriages and with our family and with our kids and at the workplace. Right? That's the original design or destiny and that God has laid out for Adam and Eve. And that's what he's also called us to do. Okay, so he's saying, commit to those things. Commit to love. Commit to joy, peace, and patience, and kindness, and goodness, and self-control. When you commit to those things, they become your culture. Right? Remember I told you values are the things that we value. We're going to value joy, but how do you practice it? You're going to commit to being joyful. So in the midst of struggles or hardships, we're still going to find joy in the tribulation. 
okay? It's an agreement. It's an agreement between Adam and Eve. It's an agreement between husband and wife and the keiki, okay? That we're going to agree to the values that God has set forth and that we're going to practice them, right? Because if you don't agree to the fact that God is saying, oh, be loving, well then, there's not going to be unity in the family. So there has to be an agreement between husband and wife and the kids that this is what we value and this is what we're going to practice. So God sets that out first. And so why does God not let Adam and Eve just do it themselves? That's a pretty obvious one, right? Because, man, they're different. I don't know if you guys are married. Maybe you have a a brother or sister. Um, Maybe you've met the opposite sex before. (laughs) And you'll realize, guys, we're different. We're different. We're super different. The way that girls think, I will never get. I just don't understand it. And if it were up to me, and if I were to set the culture for my home, do you bet that it's going to be different than the culture that the wife sets for the home? Absolutely. Why? Because we're wired differently. We think differently. So if we come to an agreement, husband and wife, kids, that maybe we're not the best one to establish culture and values, but we look at the one who's perfect and say, what is his values that we can all come to an agreement with? Then you can say, well, it's not my values. It's the Lord's values that he's spoken into us. And therefore, why? Because then we can have peace, that it's not me that said this. This is God who says this, and he brings peace into the home. Okay? So that's why God doesn't let Adam and Eve choose what kind of culture they're going to create. He speaks it right into them. He says, be fruitful. Be fruitful. Be committed to love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and self-control. That's the values. That's the culture that I want to have in your families. The other reason is that God is a loving father and his children just don't always know and so what he does is he models to us fathers and mothers that it's our job to set the culture in the home it's not up to our children to set the culture and they think it is I have four kids who think that it's their job to set the culture in my home. And every single day I have to remind them, no, that's my job, right? That's my job to set the culture in the home. Your job is to agree with it. And I'm not coming with this up on my own, guys. I'm a humble father who doesn't know everything, and so where's my culture piece coming from? It's coming from the Word of God. And so when the kids see that, it's like, wow, dad and mom don't know everything. They're also leaning upon God to get the culture for our home. And what do we model to our kids? It's a beautiful thing that as parents, we can model to our children that we are humble and that we don't have everything figured out, that we lean upon Christ and we lean upon His Word. Culture is one of those funny things, guys. Um, I'm from Hawaii. I'm born and raised like a local brother, right? But if you noticed, my bride, she no stay from here, okay? She is from Michigan. I mean, wow, that is like, and not just like any Michigan, you know what I mean? Like, like northern Michigan, sticks in the woods kind, right? Man, totally raised, completely different. And of course, man, I could go on and on about how many funny cultural differences and stories that we've had. But obviously, one of them was communication. To give you an example of that communication miscue that we've had, I have a little video that kind of shows what troubles we've had. Let me show that video. I know, okay, uh, you the one said you like scraps, so give them, brah.
How's it? This is Brother Grant. We stay Waikiki. Key. We can talk to some tourists, see if they can figure out what I'm trying to say. Ain't no act Bombay, you going to get lit. Ain't no act Bombay, you going to get licked. Heck no. Act Bombay, you got licked. Do you want to buy me liquor? Oh. Um, I got to get something to eat. Okay. Sounds like you just got in a fight. Or about to be getting in a fight. <laughs> If you stop by my house, I'll give you a lick. <laughs> um, hey, don't do that. You're gonna get hurt. Right. Hey, no act, Bombay, you can get licked. Hey, no act, Bombay, you can get licked is like, um, hey, don't act like that. You're gonna get beat up. I oh, knew yeah. it was something like that. Was, yeah. I was close. Yeah. Shoots, bro. We go cruise when you pa hana. Shots. Bro, we got cruise when you pa hana. She got the got go cruise when you pa ha. Oh my goodness, that's a hard one. <laughs> sure, bro, let's go cruise and something in Poana. Poana. <laughs> Shoots, bro, we go cruise when you pa hana. Shoots, bro, we go cruise when you pa hana is like, hey man, let's go hang out when you're done with work. Okay, <laughs> cruise. Yeah, yeah, cruise around. Yeah. yeah. Oh, D's grins and the broke the mop. <laughs> Ho these grinds is broke them out. Ho these grinds is broke them out. Ho these grinds is broke the mouth. Ho those grinds is broken the mood. Ho these grinds and broke that mouth. I have no idea. I don't know, um, somebody broke the. Yeah, I'm I don't someone. know. Holy Grimes, he just broke them out. All right. Holy these Grimes, he's broke them out. These Grimes, he's broke them out is um. Wow, this food is really good. Uh, like, he broke them out. I was like, oh, like it's so good. Like I can't even chew anymore. I would never <laughs> Oh man, that is too funny. Um, can anybody relate to that? Oh man, that was my wife and I probably for the first year. Like, what are you saying, man? Are you cussing at me right now? You know what I mean? I was like, oh man, I was like, one of my favorites was like, oh, bro. Uh, the kind stay coming, huh? <coughs> are they staying or are they coming? Like, what? I, I don't understand what's going on. I was like, man, I love the, the language that I grew up with, but she did not understand it. And that cultural difference sometimes can play havoc on your families. Uh, it can really mess up marriages and things like that. And so it's just a funny thing culture can influence. But why is culture so important? I say it like this, it's like our culture is the compass for our families. Let me say that again. Our culture is the compass for our families. Take it this way. If you look at God as the destination of where we're headed as a family, we're trying to get closer to Him. How do we get closer to Him? by the compass of our families, by our culture. So by you setting a culture of praying faithfully, of worshiping in your home, it's like that becomes your compass to getting closer to Christ. Or your culture in your home is taking you farther away from Him. He is the destination. He is our goal. He is our prize so we're trying to be more like him. We're trying to be perfected by him. And the only way that that happens is by setting a culture, right, that directs us in, those, in, in the direction that he's at. Does that make sense to you guys? That our culture has to be the compass that guides us to him. This culture is, a, is also, it's what makes our family shine to those who don't know him. Jesus set this up, right? Because he had 12 disciples coming from different families in different towns and raised maybe in different ways. And when he left, he had to make sure an established culture was set. And what he says to them, in John 13, 34, he says, a new commandment I give you, 
to love one another. As I have loved you so much, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If there is an agreement between the 12 of you that no matter what happens, that we say that we're going to love each other, what is that going to do? That's not only going to come to an agreement that we're going to love each other, but that's how everybody else will know. That we will see impact in our communities if the culture that we agree to is the one that Jesus sets for us. I raise my kids to call their elders auntie and uncle. Some of you guys may do the same as well. And so when people come over to the house, they will, it's like, wow, your kids honor me by calling me auntie or uncle. Or you know what? If you see them running around and you talk to them, they'll say, what was that uncle? What was that auntie? And you probably will recognize that that's, maybe that's one of the Vasco kids. And for me, that's pride. Why? Because you, when you raise them right to follow the values that you've established in your home, then they stick out amongst the crowd, amongst the kids that may not call you auntie and uncle, but my kids, they will. And they will honor you, right? And that's what I'm trying to teach. And that's what we're trying to teach in our homes, that not just they stay in the homes, but you take this culture and you infiltrate it. And then you become a light in the community, right? Because if the culture that we have in our home only stays in our home, guys, it's not doing any good. It has to transform our communities, right? It can't just be in the home. We teach our kids, we teach ourselves, and then we go out and we shine for Jesus in a culture that doesn't say to love each other more than you love yourself. Romans 12. I'm going to end this way, guys, and I want you guys to get stirred up a little bit because this is what happens when you set a culture in your home Romans 12, let this be the culture of your home, okay? Romans 12, 9 through 21, write it down. Let's read it together. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear brothers and friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Verse 21 says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Wow, that is the culture that we want to represent in our marriages and in our families and when we go out. Guys, I counted 18 values that he put down there, 18 culture pieces that he has called us to buy into. 18, sincere love, hate evil, love what is good, devoted to one another in love, Honor one another above myself, passionate for God. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, generous to the needy. Practice hospitality. Bless my enemies. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live peacefully with everyone around me and stay humble. Care for those who are considered outcasts. Do not take revenge. I will not take revenge and overcome evil with good. And I put in one that wasn't in there and it says, speak life, not death. Guys, as we leave here today, the application has to be that you take Romans 9 
and say, maybe let's go after one of these things and let's begin to shift our families because the reality is that if we want to see change in our families, we need to change the culture of our families. We need to change the culture of our family to be the one that not you put in front of your kids or your wife, but the one that God has asked us to follow. Stand up with me. We need to activate ourselves this morning. I feel like if you are saying yes this morning to this commitment, that I am going to commit to living a life that is representative of these values, stand up and we're going to make this commitment not only to our spouses that we're here with, we're going to make them to our children, we're going to make them to this family here our church family, right? That when our church family gets together, that when we enter this house, that this is the culture that we are buying into. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the culture that you have called us to be, the culture that you have established from kingdom, that we would be people that are so deeply committed to the culture of the kingdom that our marriages will be changed, that our families will be changed, that our jobs and our workplaces will be changed. So God, in our hearts today, we stand and say yes and amen to the commitment it is to walk out your kingdom's culture. In Jesus' name, let's say, amen.